So uh, without uh, taking any more time on those logistics, I wanted to introduce to you our moderator for today. We're very, very excited to have October Ivins here with us today. October is the principal of Ivins eContent Solutions. Um, she's an academic librarian. She worked for 20 years at UNC and at Louisiana State University. She's an independent consultant to publishers and other content providers, associations, libraries, and consortia. Uh, she's the past president of the North American Serials Interest Group and is active in ALA's ELEX division. She's the past president of the Society for Scholarly Publishers and she co-chairs their organizational collaboration committee. Uh, she, uh, so we are just very, very delighted to have her here today to moderate and um, carry forward our discussion with us. And I will turn it over to you, October. Um, good morning. I'm really pleased to be here with you and and I was excited to to accept when I saw what a strong set of panels and speakers that are organized for for your education today. Um, we really want this to be a dialogue both between the panelists and among you and them, so please be thinking about your questions. We're going to set this up so there will be a few minutes for questions after each speaker, about five minutes for questions, and then at the end of the panel we'll have a few questions for both of the panelists. Um, so we'll be doing that format for this first set and then for the faculty panel as well. The faculty panel Two of our faculty members will be with us and one will be on Skype. And after that session concludes, we'll have more general discussion of all of the panelists. So do be thinking about your questions. Um, to get us started, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bob Kelly. We're just comparing notes. We think we've known each other for about... Um, 15 years? Yeah. Um, he has been an active member of the Society for Scholarly Publishing as well. Um, he's been on panels that I've put together. In the early years of e-journals and digital publishing, there were about four societies that seemed to be on every panel you went to at ALA or ACRL or anywhere else. And as one of the early publishers to do that, the American Physical Society was frequently represented. So on to Bob himself. Bob Kelly is an innovator and a digital pioneer. As a longtime advocate of composing with markup language to create source files that can be formatted for multiple uses. At IBM, his team brought Book Manager to the market and then used it to put all 3,000 of their manuals online in 1987. Bob then joined the APS to help bring physical review letters online. And I'm not sure how many of you are, are familiar with this one, but it's one that has like a zillion pages. It's an enormous journal. Um, after that, all of the other APS journals came online, and they did the entire back file to 1893. Bob has given numerous conference and workshop presentations in the U.S. and Europe on the strategic value of encoding using the standard markup languages and building information archives that can deliver multiple formats. He is moving on to another exciting phase of his life, devoting full time to his photography business when he retires next month. This is his last public appearance. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Bob Kelly. My slides will be around eventually. Uh, that's fine. I'm with the American Physical Society. <clears throat> I've prepared, as usual, far too many slides that are needed uh, for the 20 minutes that I've been allocated. So what I'm going to do is make them available to anybody who wants them, and we can go from there. But I wanted to tell a story about APS. APS uh, was founded back in the uh, 1898 time frame, Physical Review. The journals that we now publish was founded in, in Cornell in 1893. Uh, somewhere around 1913, the two of them came together and the journals became the journals of the American Physical Society. Uh, you can see uh, this 
go to this one. Yeah. You can see why I like to use uh, iPads and stuff because I don't. Have, it's not on the screen. Oh. My apologies. Uh, anyway, am I on? Can I hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sounds familiar. Uh, APS uh, was founded as a society in North America to provide a, a vehicle for physicists, experimental and theoretical physicists, to get together in the United States and start to share and, and, and come together. And they primarily did meetings for a very long time until Physical Review came into the fold. <clears throat> uh, APS has been publishing the Physical Review, uh, but there's always been a suspicion that the future of physics communication, scholarly communication, was going to evolve and change. Uh, one of the slides that I would show you uh, is a letter from Sam Gottsmith back in 1964 or 68, who was the editor of Physical Review at the time, who said, why are we doing this? He said, most physicists know everything they were talking about anyway, well in advance of it being published, and nobody could read the content. Uh, Nobody could read all the content that we publish anyway. Uh, that was kind of filed away because we continued to do it. And then in 1991, we published a report from the American Physical Society called On the Future of Technology and the Journals. And that was called the Loken Report. And it was published in the Bulletin of the American Physical Society. And basically, it predicted that there would be this worldwide scientific database of content that would include not only documentation and journals, but all kinds of other content. And I was brought on board into the society in 1993 after retiring from IBM to make that happen. And that's what I've been working on, and that's the story of open access from the point of view of the American Physical Society. And the, and the point is that our goal <clears throat> is to widely disseminate the knowledge of physics. And you'll see that on the slides if, uh, when you look at them. And the question is, how do we do it in such a way that works? And how do we do it uh, with the challenges that are out there, especially if we're looking at it from the point of view of... Uh, of all the disciplines of science, because one of the things that is starting to, uh, that is surfacing, is that science is really integrated, that what applies to a physicist also applies to a biologist and so forth, in many cases, that there's a, a large amount of knowledge that applies across multiple disciplines. And so one of the challenges is how do we connect the dots so that the knowledge that's published or available in one discipline is available in other disciplines, and how do you make it understandable, how do you make it connectable, and so forth. So that's what I've been working on. That's what we've been working on since uh, I came on board, which was in 1993. I can do this without slides. We'll, we'll just give them away. So, okay. okay. I appreciate it because for some reason it's just not recognizing my laptop anymore. That's okay. There's, there's one slide I want to show you, uh, and you can possibly see it from here, and that's the slide <laughs> of, the, of the old adage that if you get five blind or six blind people together around an elephant, how do you describe it? Okay, you describe it multiple ways. That's open access, okay? Open access, which is a model, a business model, covering all the disciplines in science, at least the public disciplines, on a worldwide basis, is defined by multiple people in multiple ways. So how do you bring rationalization to that? And how do you put it all together? And if you think I'm going to give you the answer, I don't know. But what I do know is that we can get ready for it as the answer starts to percolate. And that was the path that we went on back in 1993 when we decided to go online. October mentioned that my uh, forte was using standardized markup languages to do the content. And the point of that was that if you do content in a way that is standardized, you can reuse it. And you don't have to do other things to it to make it, to repurpose it, to do it. Oh, I'm getting there. We're almost there. Okay, well, we're going to have to move fast. I'm going to get that. <laughs> I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that. Uh, don't move. Oh, don't, I'm don't just going to sit here, and I'm going to advance your slides to wherever you want. I don't know where I want them. I, I need it up here. Okay. All right. We'll get it up here. Gently. And you take this away. You are the consummate professional speaker. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, I, you know, it was said that I'm retiring. Uh, I gave this slide talk smaller 
1983 at IBM that said that if you do the content in such a way that you can reuse it, you can do lots of things with it. And it's kind of a variation of the same thing. Uh, I'm at a point in my career where people seem to understand that, so it's time to go off and take pictures and play with my grandchildren and, and take naps. Uh, but I, I, let me just go through these quickly. Uh, I talked about that task force report in 1991. Basically, the idea was that there would be this worldwide, data. this was before the web, by the way. This was before the web was really accepted. This was before GML or HTML was accepted. This was before, before people had terminals. This was before we were all connected. But they said, this is coming. And this is available. If anybody wants it, I'll send you a copy of it. Because uh, it's an interesting view of the world on something that's actually starting to happen. And they said that it would be up to APS to figure out how to do it. And that's when I left IBM and they hired me to help make it happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've been moving towards that in a kind of a heuristic and a holistic approach, and I'll talk about that. But we started out in 1994 by saying that ePrints, uh, which were preprints online, uh, Paul Ginsburg built that database out in Los Alamos, we said that was legitimate. Now, that was heresy in a lot of the publishing world because they were saying, wow, you know, you, if you put it on the internet, you're publishing it, you can't do peer review. And we said, fooey, or words to that effect. And we said that. What we can do is we can let, recognize this as a legitimate part of the communications process, and that's what we're all about, is the legitimizing and making and enhancing the communication process. So we said that in 1994, that it was okay. We were essentially green open access, if you're familiar with the term, in 1994. That was before open access was added to the end of it, or even the word green. We were working our way down that path. And we've gone all the way through a whole set of things, including Creative Commons licensing, allowing the reuse of our content. APS has a statement on open access. This was reinforced in uh, Finland earlier last week by our president, and basically it says that we support the principles of open access, period. Uh, no uh, no uh, qualifiers. We support it, and we're going to work our way to do it assuming we could do it in a sustainable way because whatever else you have to think about in these things you got to stay in business you got to support yourself uh, as uh, Robert Heinlein said in the moon is your horse mistress back in the 50s uh, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch and there ain't no such thing as a free lunch and we're going to try to keep lunch cheap <clears throat> low cost but still we got to buy the sandwiches uh, Joe Serene who is my uh, publisher the treasurer had said that you can't be, you have to be gen, uh, dangerous about generalizing, and that's true. We got to kind of pick our way through the whole process. And here's why: this is the system that open access is trying to inhabit. Thank you. <coughs> it's a system that is universal. It's a system that changes by discipline or has di players from different disciplines. It's a system that is growing. It's a system that is primarily supported by the subscription model. Uh, it's a, s a model that works, and yet we're looking to expand it. We're looking to make it the information more widely available. Our motivator is to make information more widely available. And I'd be glad to discuss. Uh, I've been using this slide. By the way, if you look at the uh, the Earth in the middle, it's. Uh, Penanga, is that the, the way Earth was formed before the continents split apart? Well, that's a map of the gold globe before it all split apart, and now we're trying to split it apart and yet keep it together. I mentioned this slide. This is the thing that we're trying to challenge is make sure everybody sees it the same way because if you don't, you end up s destroying the system, and what, that's not what we want to do. So if you look at APS, We've done a lot to get ready for this. We've re-engineered our whole peer review process going from a paper process. We've cut our costs uh, in composition from over $70 a page down to $30, $30 and under per page. Uh, we are using HTML or XML now to, so that we can per repurpose all the content. And our journals are online back to 1893. Okay, we've set up that archive. Uh, and they're all delivered from APS platforms. So we've done a lot to control the cost by doing it ourselves. The environment has changed. In 1994, we had 20,000 articles that were peer reviewed. And by the way, this is an international peer reviewing process that covers basically a third from the US, maybe a little less, a third from Europe, and a third from, the, uh, from China or from Asia. Uh, we peer review, this, in 2010, we managed 35,000 
143 articles. So that means that every couple of minutes a new article came flying in through the web to be peer reviewed and sent out to be reviewed and we published a little over 18,000 of the articles. We grew from seven journals to nine journals plus we do this free journal called Physics or Focus which is review articles on the, what we think are the hot topics of the day. And that's freely available. The environment has changed in, in ways that we try to uh, control the prices. We introduced tier pricing because when we went online back in 1994, 1995, <clears throat> we lost huge amounts of multiple subscriptions and we had to figure out a way to normalize that. So we went to this tier pricing system, uh, but we've been lowering the prices. Actually, we lowered our prices twice in the, two th uh, in the, in the first decade of this century, uh, which was kind of a shocker to a lot of other people when we announced that we were lowering our prices. There's not much meat left to lower the price, so we've got to put some more soup in the pot to, to find other ways to make it happen. If you look at the prices to uh, an institution, an institution in 1998, one of the institutions represented in this room was paying us $38,000 for content. Uh, in, 19, in 2004, they're paying $24,000, and that gives access online to everything that we publish all the way back to 1893 to the entire institution. So the prices have been lowered. We've been driving them down in that way. The point is that we try to lower prices. Am I there yet? No. Okay. Uh, I said. Oh, and access is one of our guiding principles. This has been voted on at the executive board, at the council. <clears throat> one of the things we recently did was we provided free access to public and high school libraries. And you'll be surprised how many public and high school libraries are actually want to read physical review. I mean, and it's not just the Bronx High School of Science or whatever the equivalent is up here. It's, uh, it's multiple high schools and public libraries. Now, I would suspect that most of the public libraries have editors somewhere living in their neighborhood, but nonetheless, it is free and it is available. The environment has changed again is that when you look from open access, we've been green since I came on board. You could always post your articles on the internet unequivocally, your version of the article, no problem. We worked our way through an evolution in copyright to the point of where authors can make derivative works and so forth and so on. You can read all this stuff. Um, but we kept liberalizing and making this stuff that we publish more usable, more freely available because it's not just free to read that's important in this equation. It's free to use, free to be available, free to connect and, and so forth. The environment has changed again, as I mentioned. Uh, We've been green. We've got a traditional offering of reviews of modern physics. That's a traditional journal. We have six hybrid journals where people can pay to have an article published within the journal, and it's open access. And when I say open access, it means it's free, period. No embargoes. Uh, it's free to be reused. It's free that if you can get it, you can reuse it. The authors can post it anywhere. People can do whatever they want with the article that we've published. We've also got three gold open access journals. I won't even talk. Physics was an art, uh, a review series that we started publishing and still are. Special Topics, Accelerators, and Beams was a laboratory-sponsored article because we're looking for funding models that can, uh, can bring this thing forward. And again, every discipline is different, okay, because, the, you know, not every discipline has CERN or Brookhaven Laboratories. Uh, or not every discipline in physics has uh, those things. Uh, but back in 1998, we, approached, we were approached by the APS Division of Accelerators and Beams saying we need a place to publish. So we went back out, the editor-in-chief went out and talked to the uh, heads of the various laboratories at CERN, Brookhaven, the Accelerator Labs around the world, and said if you'll sponsor this, we'll do it. And there'll be no fee to the reader, no fee to the user, no fee to the, uh, to the author. And it, they did it, and it's been successful. Uh, we're not making, we're not completely in the black, but, and we're subsidizing it to a degree, because it's kind of like uh, National Public Radio or PBS. We haven't gotten to the point of giving away coffee cups yet, but, you know, uh, but we're there, we're there. Special Topics Education Research is one that we started a, a while ago, and that's a journal, five minutes. I'm going to move on. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> This is our OA model, and we can continue this, and I'll, by the way, the charts are my thing here, so if you want to sit down and talk, I'll take you through the whole thing. Uh, our journals, we have three gold open access journals, seven uh, hybrid journals, public access initiatives, I said all that, don't need to say it again. Uh, they supported, I mentioned accelerators and beams, I'm going to skip through this, it charts us, we charge 
$1,700 an article to, uh, to publish an, an open access article. That's primarily author pays, although we've had people in institutions paying for us. We're shying away from offering a subscription model to institutions, although we could, we're not opposed to it, that says, give us X number of dollars and your authors can publish for Y number of articles or whatever like that. But right now, that's just a subscription model. We're trying to find some more innovative ways to go forward with this thing. The, uh, I talked about these. You know, uh, as I said, no embargoes. The eight authors can put their own version on anywhere they want. The author's version is okay anywhere. Uh, we yada 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 yada, and we have agreements with MIT and Harvard uh, to make sure this is in place within their organization. In fact, Ellen worked it out with uh, my treasurer, Joe Shireen, to get a nice agreement going, and we're very open to agreements, institutional agreements. Uh, it didn't hurt. Just a quick point: the uh, our green journal, a totally green journal, High Energy Physics Physical Review D, is our third highest site impact factor journal. People are downloading the articles. Uh, and you say, well, why are they downloading them? Because they're all freely available. And I say, because they want to, because they can. They're publishing because they want it to be in the system. Uh, one of the services that we provide is that the system, a, an article published by us or by a publisher gets into the system. It gets into ISI, it gets into all the citation indexes, it gets into the accounting seat, it gets into that whole bailiwick, three minutes. Are those very long minutes? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. I have more time? I'm not going to argue with her. She's, she's got the hook. Okay. Uh, I, I just got a few slides left. We talk about funding. We understand the subscription model. We all understand the subscription model. We understand what the problems are with the subscription model in terms of abuse. But we also all understand that there needs to be a way to pay for this stuff. We're in negotiation with CERN on this concept called Scope 3. I don't know if any of you have heard about it. Scope 3 is a way to put all high energy physics literature online, freely available, open access, creative commons. We are negotiating with them and assuming it can come forward in a way that's sustainable, we're going to go with it. We are not going to jeopardize the existence of a journal on something that we don't believe is sustainable. But we will go forward with it. And that's where we're heuristic. We're looking for ways to do it differently. As I said, the environment has changed. We are strong in this Vision 2020 view. Our latest journals are all Creative Commons, uh, the open access journals, including the uh, the hybrid journals, which that means is that the auto can be reused commercially too. I mean, so if you get the, you have the article and you want to republish it, you want to repackage it, fine. Uh, that's not our problem. If you want to use it in the cost pack, that's not our problem. But it's only for those that are in the open access arena. Uh, we'll provide the XML possibly for a fee for somebody who wants to redo it. Right now, I make, we make a little bit extra money selling XML to, uh, to services like ISI and so forth to include within their thing. And that's a point of reusing the content that you developed. We now want to work on data, whatever that means. Or however, I mean, if we think that articles is a challenge to normalize, data becomes a whole new raft, a whole new dimension of challenges in the process. We're working on interactive content because there's a belief, you know, there's been this thing ever since I got into this game. It's, oh, we can have interactive math. We can, you know, do all this stuff. Sometimes, yes. And we're trying to work out what does that mean in the physics world. Uh, we're looking at author and institutional identifiers. You wouldn't believe how many different ways there are to say Bob Kelly or R.A. Kelly or Robert Arthur Kelly or whatever. And guess what? I may use one as a whim, and I'll move to another one. So I go into the system, and you know there are dozens of ways that I'm reflected, or not dozens, six. Uh, how many ways to say MIT, or the physics department of MIT? The subscription identifiers are all uh, need to be normalized so that we can we know who we're talking about. We're working on accessible content. That's to make the content available to people who are print disabled. I've been working with a physicist, John Gardner, out in Oregon to make complex mathematics available to the blind. We would like to publish physical review to the blind and do that by utilizing the content that we've made that's repurposable, available in a way that blind people can do it. There's one promising thing that's going to make that happen. And that's this thing. The iPad is the most accessible device for blind people on the market today. 
blind people can actually use the iPad straight out of the box without providing any extra software to it. If you ever get one and you turn on the accessibility, it rearranges the entire way that you interface with it. And then you got to figure out how to shut it off because you just keep yak, 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 yak. <laughs> <clears throat> we want to work on semantic tagging, and that's the thing that's going to allow us to cross disciplines and link things together. An example of crossing disciplines is some of these databases like Conatea or Site You Like, where people from multiple disciplines will refer to articles that they're reading, and they may refer to an article that they found, it's in physics, and another one that happens to be in, uh, in biology or, or, or whatever. Uh, and that's a tagging, that's a link of content across disciplines. The semantic tagging says that we ought to find a way normalizing the tags that say tomato and tomato are the same thing and, 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 and connecting the articles. And we're working on that. So, I didn't quite run out of time. There you are. Thank you. Uh, this is our view. And the view is that there's a commons out there with all the content. It's based upon open access. Uh, it's based upon reuse. It's based upon all of the disciplines together, and I don't know how to get there, but getting there, based upon flexibility for, information, for future innovation. However, it's up to you guys, not up to us. Okay, we'll go where the disciplines lead us. We're ready to make it available. We have lowered our prices as low as we could. You know, we've squeezed everything out of the bone. We've, uh, we're ready to, to uh, repurpose the content. We can do a lot with it. We need some direction or some support. We need people to say, I want to do this. You know, or, and, then, and then there's all the international discipline and things that are involved in that whole thing. And that's my talk. And I say thank you. <clears throat> so we want to go from here to there. Yeah, R.A. R. R. Kelly at APS.org. And uh, because I'm a retiring director, I get to keep my email address for the next two years. So it will work. And I've joined SLA as a retiree uh, because, of all, as October mentioned, all these conferences that I speak at, I'm not pandering, but the librarians are my favorite part of this whole offer. <laughs> And, and what I'm trying to do, you know, and I want to keep involved in that. And it's also accessibility. But it's R-A-K-E-L-L-Y at APS dot O-R-G. Why is physics so far ahead? Other disciplines? Uh, I mean, obviously one of our interests, and I mean, you can say that, because I'm not an expert, but it seems like there are ways in which in physics, y'all are kind of ahead of many of the others Well, no, <laughs> I can answer it. Uh, what is it about physics that makes it seem to work? Uh, well, first I want to say that physics isn't homogenized. Uh, physics is a wide variety of egocentric disciplines who think that their way of doing everything is the best way, unlike the rest of us in this room, right? But, and, uh, and so the thing that we had in physics that made this thing really take off was Tim Berners-Lee being a particle physicist out in, in CERN who put together the web, the idea of the web as a vehicle for sharing documentation across the high energy physics labs, across computer systems. So there was a culture, at least in the high energy world, of preprints, of sharing content. So we took that as the first step. Uh, we worked with Paul Ginspark uh, to ensure that there was an advantage to doing a preprint because you could submit articles directly to us from the preprint server. That then slowly spread to other domains of physics. But there are not it's not universal across physics. Uh, if you look at our journals, our journals are predominantly are discipline specific, from general sp physics to uh, uh, nuclear to condensed matter. I mean, uh, and the 
cultures in those disciplines have different views of open access. Okay, we provide it to them, we go out and I give talks on it, and they say, I don't want to do that. Now they're, or they do. Uh, how do I do it? You got to pay. I don't want to do that. You know, uh, we don't have a CERN or a uh, Los Alamos in the, in most of the disciplines that can step up and say we'll be the funder and sponsor of this. So then it falls back to the universities, you know, uh, and that's why people are going in in, in that vein. Uh, there's a uh, reluctance to share content before it's published. Okay, and it depends upon the discipline. You know, as you get into more uh, practical physics, uh, there are patent issues and, 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 and so forth that get into play that people don't want to share. So uh, are we going to get there? I don't know. Uh, are we going to get to the point where we can go forward with semantic tagging and, and, and accessibility and, and all that stuff and low cost? Yes. Uh, will that be an incentive for more and more people to get into the game and play because they want to see their content connected to content from other disciplines or, or they find it interesting to be connected from a uh, physics of fluids article to a uh, biology, a vascular theory article or something like that. Uh, but it's a big challenge and it's not universal, you know, if I s came across thinking that physics really was on board with this, it's not true. Okay, APS is on board with this. Uh, as a society, we're on board with it. As a discipline, we're not. I'm not, and I'm not a physicist, by the way. I'm just a conciliary who came in from the outside. Another question? Um, let's hold up for next week. I don't want him to talk. <laughs> oh, yes, he's driving me back to the hotel. Yes, he's talking. <laughs> I want to ride. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy.